Hello, my name is Ryan, and welcome to Insert Title Here. With this being the opening weekend for A Star is Born, I thought I should go back and look at its previous adaptations to see how it is that this story gets more remakes than the Fantastic Four does. The Lady Gaga Bradley Cooper vehicle is actually the fourth rendition of this story, with the first being in 1937 with actors Janet Gaynor and Frederick March, the second in 1954 with Judy Garland and James Mason, and the third in 1976 with Robert Streisand and Chris Christopherson. Wait, a forewarning. Before I get started, this video is going to be talking about the story of the previous films, so if you know nothing about the story of this movie, and don't want the new one spoiled for you, stop now. We're entering spoiler territory. Spoilers. 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 You've been warned. The 1937 version of A Star is Born starts in North Dakota with farm girl Esther Blodgett coming back from the movies and her family immediately proceeding to mock and discourage her for liking the movies so much and wanting to be in them. And really, they have no right to talk. They know where they are. The movie literally starts and ends be like showing the script pages of the movie. They know where they are. Esther Zand is an especially harsh critic, but her words are stopped quickly by her own natural enemy, the amazing granny. You in your movies, that's all you think about. You shouldn't be allowed to go to him at all if you're asking me. Too bad I was so busy in the kitchen. I didn't hear anybody asking you. Later, the amazing granny goes to Esther's room and tells her the story of how she followed her dream of getting on a prairie schooner with Esther's grandfather and crossing the country. She even buried her husband and kept on going the rest of the trip by herself. She, Granny's, the, Granny's awesome. She, she, she won. She won Oregon Trail. No, they're in North Dakota. So she won North Dakota Trail. But whatever works. She won. Granny decides that it's time for Esther to follow her own dream and gives her money so that she can go to Hollywood. Afterwards, she gives Esther some foreshadowing advice, but I'm not going to address it just yet. I'll address it at the end of me talking about this movie. Because look, Granny has another wisecrack comment. Oh, I can't take your money. Uh, why not? It's your savings. Well, I was only saving up for my funeral. Now I don't think I'm ever going to die. In Hollywood, Esther learns very quickly that it's not as easy to become a star as she wants it to be. There are too many extras for hire in film already, and Esther spends months looking for work. We eventually meet Esther's BFF for the movie, Danny McGuire. He will be the friend-zoned BFF for the rest of this movie. Between Awesome Granny and Danny, Esther seems pretty covered for money because she winds up running out and winds up getting more help from them in order to stay in Hollywood while she keeps on trying to find a job. Danny even gets her a job as a waitress, but she gets kind of butthurt about it, which annoys me. It's like, dude, Danny's setting you up, and you, you gotta take it. You gotta take it. You do. Because, apparently, the only reason she even takes it, though, is because she finds out it's a Hollywood party for big shots, so she feels like she can audition for them as a waitress. Well, it's kind of a picture job if you look at it, right? You said it was a waitress. Well, it's waitressing for Casey Burke, the big director over at our studio. And that's the only reason she took the nice offer Danny gave her. You don't deserve Danny, Esther. So this is the me cute moment of the movie where Norman Maine, an established actor who is known for being a notorious drunk, meets her while he's just taking food off her tray and then all of a sudden he does a double take and is totally enamored with her. No, thank you. Yes, I, uh, pardon me. Hi. Lovely, lovely. No, I mean the caviar. Mm -hmm. No, don't, don't go away. I'm, I'm starving. Huh? It's the weakest meat cute of the movies. But it's fine, I guess. I mean, golden age of Hollywood, I'm pretty sure looks was one of the main things they cared about. And that was it. I mean, at least in the other films, the lead actresses are singers. You know, so the actor notices their voice, which is what attracts him to them and helps him realize they have talent. Yeah. So, so this is the weakest of, of, of the connections, but you know what, it's still fine. 
Norman and Esther get separated because Norman gets pulled away because of a jealous girlfriend. But later he meets up with her again and then gives her a ride home. Actually, I guess he never got paid for being a waitress because he took her out in the middle of the party. You're honest, we gotta get out of here. Well, I can't. The dishes aren't finished. Oh, yes, they are. Oh. So Danny's efforts went to waste. Poor Danny. Norman gives Esther a ride home, and he talks about how he knows she wants to be a star in Hollywood. And then he walks her to her door and kisses her. Okay, they barely know each other, but I will give Norman Maine this. He is a very charming man, even if he is drunk. In this, in this 37 version, he, he does get pretty drunk and does some pretty bad things, but it seems he's always able to articulate, uh, articulate himself very well and keep some charm flowing. I can understand why a young, small-town girl would be entranced by him, regardless of his drunken demeanor. She's about to go back inside the boarding house when Norman drops the line that seems to be in every single version of this movie. Hey! Do you mind if I take just one more look? Hey. Mm -hmm. I just want to take another look at you. Hey. What? I just want to take another look at you. I'm sorry, I seriously can't find a clip of the 1976 version. It bothers me. I looked for a long time. Honestly, I'm filming this video on a Friday. I was supposed to be filmed on Wednesday and out on Thursday. I had to put up a spare video I had because I couldn't find a clip to use from 1976. I apologize. Norman sets Esther up for a screen test at his producer Oliver Niles' studio. And from her point of view, you see how overwhelming first time on set can be. Which is a nice perspective to have for this kind of movie. Once you get signed to the studio, their publicist, Matt Libby, decides that Esther needs to change her name. Apparently Esther Blodgett doesn't cut it as a Hollywood name. So they switch it from that to Vicki Lester. She starts off with how she thinks is well enough. She's given a one-line role in a movie and tells Norman so. And he's like, nah, you're going to be my leading lady in the new movie I'm doing. Just takes her to the producer. He's like, hey, this is happening. Oh, okay, all right, great. Easy enough. This is the point of the movie where everything kind of changes for them. After the premiere, people are raving about Vicki Lester's new performance, and comic cards from the watchers later let the studio know that Vicki Lester has a 97% positive rating. Rotten Tomatoes before Rotten Tomatoes on comic cards. Matt Libby smugly talks about how Norman Maine didn't seem to turn in such a great performance though, and how the audience didn't seem to care much about him. Esther and Norman decide that they're going to get married under the conditions that he becomes more responsible and stops drinking. They let Oliver Niles know, and he decides that it's good for the studio, and he's totally fine with it. Matt Libby wants them to have a big wedding that he can have press cover to give them a lot of publicity. The two decide to sneak out of town and have a Justice of the Peace perform the wedding at City Hall and have BFF Danny as a witness. And Libby shows up just as they're about to leave for their honeymoon, and he's quite annoyed by this. I mean, Matt Libby is probably the closest thing that we get to an antagonist in this movie. I mean, aside from Norman himself, or his actions as a drunkard. But Libby's had to cover Norman's actions for ten years for the studio, all of his drunken messes. So his annoyance is understandable when it comes to Norman. After the honeymoon, Norman is home a lot. He's pretty much become a stay-at-home husband. Uh, we see that his popularity pretty much dis disappeared after that movie that Esther starred in, but Esther's constantly out of the house for work. He keeps on getting calls at home thinking it's for him for work, but it's messages that he has to take for Esther. When Esther gets home, their reactions, their, the way that they, they feel towards each other, you, you understand, you, you feel happy for them because they genuinely do seem to care about each other and it, it, it's a very lovely scene to watch. I didn't mean to be late, darling, but Casey wanted All to... All right. You're here now. Anyway, I see so little of you, I'd like to have you to myself. 
Well, but it's a servant's night out. We haven't any. Yes, we have. I fixed a little snack with my own lily white hands. A messenger interrupts them, you know, spending time with each other, and the messenger doesn't recognize Norman at all. He calls him Mr. Lester. So he's bummed. Yeah, he's bummed. It's a package for you. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, uh, they want you for a benefit to Shrine Auditorium next Wednesday night. I told them I'd ask you. And, uh... Oh, darling, uh, I don't want to hear about mm -hmm. that now. Well, you better wait till I finish before I forget them all. And she really wants to, you know, spend time with him, but he's just... He's... And then you see him slip up and go for a drink. Next scene, Esther's at the Academy Awards, about to get an Oscar for Best Female Performance. Norman is surprisingly absent, and she's worried about him, but she gets called up on stage. She wins the Oscar. She's right in the middle of her speech when all of a sudden somebody's applauding in the back of the room. And it's Norman, a very drunken Norman. And he interrupts her speech and goes up and gives a speech of his own about how he deserves the Worst Performance of the Year award, and demands it. And in the middle of his speech, he accidentally backhands Esther. Don't know. Uh, she earned that Oscar, man. If I got backhanded, I would show some kind of... I mean, she just <laughs> covered that up. I mean, dang. She knows what that Oscar's worth, and she's keeping it. The look of devastation you see on Norman's face when he sits back down at her table, you you really feel like, you know, just gah in the pit of your stomach for it. It's just... He knows what he did. He screwed up. Oliver Niles goes to check up on Esther a few months later on set, and he drops a line that is probably my favorite in the movie. Aside from Awesome Granny's sick burn at the beginning. If I may talk shop, you are a knockout. No! Apparently the past three months, Norman's been at a sanitarium to help stop his drinking. Esther asks Oliver to help Norman out, maybe see if he can get him a role. And he offers him a role at the sanitarium, but it's not a leading role, it's a bit part, and Norman doesn't want it because too prideful. Yeah. He lies, says that another studio has already hired him, and that he's going to be over in England for a while, and blah, 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 blah. We see Norman get out of the sanitarium and go to the racetrack bar and order a ginger ale. So he's trying to turn over a new leaf, or a new book, as he puts it. He runs into Matt Libby at the bar, and they have a confrontation. Matt Libby doesn't have to cover for Norman anymore, so he's very liberal with how he feels about him. And it leads to a fight, and Norman loses horribly, and... Give me a scotch. Double. Leave the bottle here. Well, let's say he just goes on a four-day bender. After the four-day bender, Oliver and Esther find out that Norman's in night court. He's being sentenced for being drunk in public and driving a car and crashing it. The judge is about to give Norman 90 days in jail, but Esther speaks for him, and... Norman's put into her care. She takes responsibility for him, for being the drunk that he is, and the judge says, you understand, it's like, you, you gotta make sure this doesn't happen again. And she's like, I, I promise. And, I mean, hey, she uses a celebrity in the right way. Maybe, kinda. Maybe he should have been in jail for 90 days, considering what happens. Although, maybe it would have happened regardless of the 90 days in jail. Who knows? Later, at their home on the beach, Esther tells Oliver that She's going to quit movies. She, she has to stop doing pictures so that she can make sure that she and Norman have a happy life together. And Oliver tells her, it's like, no, you're at the peak of your stardom. You can't, you can't quit now. You've, you've got so much to work for. But she says she's got to for the sake of Norman and his life. Because to her, he gave her all that she has. And if he loses what he has, how can she be happy? Oliver disagrees with it, but he understands and says goodbye to Vicki Lester and says good luck to Mrs. Norman Maine. Unbeknownst to the two of them, Norman has overheard this entire conversation. Later, he comes out and gives himself a great performance. He tells Esther he's going to turn everything around and he's going to start off with a swim on the beach. He uses the I just want to look at you one more time line with Esther. Hey! 
Mind if I take just one more look? And then he goes out to the beach, takes off his bathrobe, walks into the tide, fade to black. And then comes back up and, hey, newspaper, Norman's been dead, found his body. Well, okay then. Great. Wonderful. Really dark turn. Well, I mean, it already had some dark turns anyway, so... Yeah. There is an out-of-place scene with Matt Libby sitting at a bar making jokes at Norman's death. And it's... Like I said, I mean, he's the closest thing we have to an antagonist in this movie, but it seems a bit... A bit much. Like you don't you don't see the uh the anger kinda comes out of left field. I mean it's understandable, but it seems like a bit of a harsh reaction really for somebody's death. Just saying. Esther is in mourning and she's packing up her house and getting ready to go back to North Dakota when all of a sudden my favorite character comes back, awesome granny. Go on, get out of here, all of you. I want to talk to my granddaughter alone. She pulls Esther off to the side and asks why she's going home. And Esther says, without Norman, I mean, how can she be a star? Alright, so let's talk about this foreshadowing bit that Granny dropped at the beginning of this movie. Because remember, Esther, for every dream of yours you may come true, you'll pay the price in heartbreak. And, I mean, alright, cool. So, Granny can see into the future, see the end of the movie. Great job, Granny. I mean, you know, it, it's true, though. She got what she wanted. She became a huge star, but, I mean, in the end, Norman took his own life, and obviously heartbreak came with it, so, you know, Granny was right. Esther's still talking about giving up movies, though, and Granny guilt trips her hard. I was proud to be the grandmother of Vicki Lester. It gave me something to live for. Now, I haven't any. Because she, she just lost her husband. Granny's like, oh, heck no. You're not quitting. <laughs> I mean, if she quits, then what did Norman die for? The movie ends with Esther, Oliver, Danny, and Granny all going to a premiere to celebrate a movie. And Esther tells on a broadcast that she's Mrs. Norman Maine. Which, I guess, is a good way to make sure Hollywood remembers Norman's name. But, uh, Fate to Black, screen page, the end. Okay. The movie was directed by William A. Wellman, who had actually won the very first Best Picture Oscar in 1929 for his 1927 film Wings. He also won Best Story Oscar for this movie. Janet Gaynor and Frederick March are both Oscar-winning actors, and Janet Gaynor was actually the first woman to receive a uh, Best Female Performance Oscar, and the only one to receive it for multiple roles. This is a film from the golden age of Hollywood celebrating the cinematic industry, while also showing a dark side to it. The story here flows very well, and the writing is really tight, with some dark humor, some nice wit, some good chemistry. I believe that can be credited to Dorothy Parker, the top build screenwriter for the movie. She was a satirist who was really well known for her wisecracks. Probably have her to thank for me laughing so hard at this line. If I may talk shop, you are a knocker. No! I'd have to say, out of the three films, this one is the best written. The 1954 version of the film pretty much follows the 1937 version exactly, except now there are musical numbers in it. Since the plots are so similar, I'll just wind up talking about the differences. The movie starts off at a benefit show that Norm is supposed to be on stage for, and he's really drunk. Matt Libby is trying to keep him from going on, and James Mason playing Norman Maine, he he plays a much more violent and, and a lot less charming of a character, at least when he's drunk. He, this Norman Maine, this drunken Norman Maine, I would actually be afraid to be around. He's got like a creepy grin going on, shot from below, it's really off-putting. His more violent nature in this movie and his being less agreeable and more wanting everything his way makes Matt Libby's antagonism towards Norman a bit more understandable in this version. I mean, seriously, he's trying to keep him from going on stage because he's drunk. He's trying to do his job, and Norman pushes him through a mirror. I mean, dang, man, I would not like somebody for doing that to me. He's trying to attack reporters, destroy their cameras, he's messing with dancers who are trying to go on stage taking other people's clothes and putting it on, and at some point he even jumps on the back of a horse to go on stage. He's, he's 
Matt Libby has his hands full, so I understand his disliking of Norman. We also get a very different version of Esther. She's already at the benefit, and she's going to be on stage performing. She's a singer for a band that's performing in Norman's place. And this version seems to be pretty savvy about how to deal with stage problems, because Norman winds up coming on stage while they're performing, and she just dances them off to save face, pretending it's part of the show. So she's pretty smart. Not near as naive as the first Esther Blodgett in the 1937 version. Norman thanks Esther for her helping him out and tries to get her to go to dinner, but she has another gig to go to. Norman gets taken home, falls asleep, and then wakes up a couple hours later stone sober and goes out into the night to find her. After he finds her and listens to her sing more, he... I mean, you know, he, he talks her into staying in Hollywood, but... Like, she, she's already worked years to get to where she is. She's talking about doing multiple jobs, you know, to have enough money to live. 1937, Esther, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Whining about one waitress job. But she's been with this band for a while now. She's going on tour across the country. Her dream is to have a record and be up near the top of the billboard. Norman talks about how, no, her singing's for Hollywood, how she shouldn't just have to be touring around, how she should be in the movies, and that her dream of being on the radio near the top of the billboard isn't big enough. The reasoning for her staying in Hollywood for becoming a star is the weakest in this movie, out of all the movies, because in the 1937 version, you have Esther wanting to be a movie star. That's what she wanted to be, and that was her dream, and she followed it. In the 76 version, and presumably in the new one, she's a musician and wants to be a musician going and touring around the country and being popular for it. This one, she already has the dream of the first one, kinda. She's on her road to it, but then they switch it to the old one. It wasn't even a dream that she wanted from the beginning, so it's not really her dream she's following, it's the vision that Norman put onto her. So that's the weakest that's the weakest reasoning for a movie out of these movies, I think. I mean, it's the 1950s, and it's the golden age of the big movie musical, so I understand it's probably going to go that direction because, you know, golden age of Hollywood that way, rock being big in the 70s, not going that way, but trying to combine them both in the middle just, in hindsight, makes it a weaker movie, I think. Um, Norman does the one more look at you bit, I just want to take another look at you. And Esther tells Danny, who is already her BFF in this movie, and a piano player for the band, that she's going to quit and stay in Hollywood. And he gets to play the discouraging family part for this movie. Uh, he's like, no, it'll never work. In the 1937 version, you had 29 minutes before there was an actual conversation between the two main leads. You had time to develop side characters. You learned about Danny. You learned about her family, and even though they were only in a couple scenes. You even learn about the personality of her landlord in the first movie. I hope you weren't attached to Awesome Granny in the first movie, because you never get to see a version of her again. 1954 version? No family. 1976 version? No family. I have problems with this version of the film, if you couldn't tell already. I will say, though, cheers for this, Esther, because... Norman winds up having to go away for six weeks to be on a movie set, but that didn't stop Esther. Danny tries to set it up so she can go back to the band, but no, she's sticking to her guns. She's going to stay in Hollywood and do this. She winds up taking on jobs she said she would never do again to keep money coming in, and she winds up singing for a commercial instead of a movie just to follow her dream, well, the dream that Norman gave her, but her dream... Anyway, thanks to the commercial, Norm is actually finally able to find Esther and bring her to Oliver Niles' studio to try and get her in films. She starts off with a faceless role, and Norman actually has to trick Oliver into listening to her sing for her to finally get a movie role. Um, after that, they really kind of follow the original story pretty closely. I mean, aside from the large amount of musical numbers, they brush over her getting a new name, 
and the reasoning behind her being in movies, but I mean the plot is still essentially the same from the 37 version. I can appreciate Garland's singing and the power behind her voice, and I understand them wanting to use that, but when you have all of this added music, it's, like I said, it's a, it's a three hour movie, it's the only one of these movies that has an intermission in it. It just, it's so long. The 1937 version, it, it, was, it had really tight writing, you had fun, and nothing felt tacked on. In the 76 version, you have musicians, and obviously they're going to be singing, but they're singing on stage, so you don't have to worry about them acting and singing at the same time. They can, they, you know, they can show emotion on their face to each other, so you get a performance as well as a singing performance. The 54 version, you, some of these songs are based in movies inside the movie, so the actor's actor has to perform and not the actor giving a performance. She's just doing the steps of an actor giving a performance, if that makes any sense. I didn't realize how complicated that was until I said it, but I mean everything comes to a stop for these songs. They stops the movie, stops it in its tracks, you don't really learn anything more about the characters until the song is done. It's like it's like riding with a student driver. You know, gets confident, builds up speed, and then something happens and you have to stop, slam on the brakes, and then confidence has to come back, they start off slow again, and you finally build up speed and then another brake. It's very jarring. It's very jarring every single time it happens. Anyway, Esther gets married to Norman, and she gets Danny a job arranging compositions for movies. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. Anyway, she, she's over the moon. You could even say that she's somewhere over the rainbow. Bad Ryan. Then we get the Norman downfall again. We get the whole shebang again. The not being recognized anymore, the drunkenness, the Oscar backhand, the sanitarium. I brush over this quickly, but I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss how well Garland acts in some of these scenes. Her sadness, her regret at feeling hate for Norman and herself for not being able to stop him from being a drunk from not making him as happy as she thought she could make him. It makes you really feel for her. I wish that this kind of like monologue was in the 37 version because of how much I like it. But, I mean, it, it's still good. She still discusses how, how she feels about Norman. But this one, Garland is actually acting her heart out for some of these scenes. So, so good, good on her. And then all the emotion is taken away because she has to perform a musical number. So there's that. Anyway, after that we get the whole Norman getting arrested, going to night court, and then talking to Niles about her quitting movies, and then he goes swimming. Again, not to brush over that so quickly, but it's essentially the same from the original movie. Although in this version we do get some scenes about, like, Matt Libby isn't making as cruel a jokes as he was in the 37 version. Even though this version I feel like he would deserve to make those kind of jokes more than the 37 version would. But, you know, he, they actually try and give him a little bit of extra character, which, which I'm fine with, you know. It's, it's an industry where people are always kind of trying to step over each other and get each other angry, so I understand how he could be antagonistic, but... I mean, like, Niles takes Libby off to the side, he's like, Man, I wish you knew Norman. And Libby's like, I knew Norman? I knew what he was going to do before he even did it. He's like, no, you, you didn't know the real Norman. And then Libby's like unsure of what to think. It's, it's extra depth I did not expect from this movie. The thing about remakes is sometimes you can deal with things that you had issues with before. Libby's anger seems more understandable here. You actually see stuff that Norman does to him and makes you understand why he dislikes him as much as he does. Norman finding Esther and thinking that she's the talented person that she is, giving her a chance at stardom, makes more sense here. And Esther being willing to put in work to try and make it is, is a better fit here. BFF Danny steals Awesome Granny's motivational speech here to get Esther back into acting. And it follows the ending of the first movie. She tells everyone she's Mrs. Norman Maine and the end. You know. Director George Cooker was actually asked to direct the 1937 version of A Star is Born because he constantly worked under the producer David O. Selznick, but he turned it down because it was too similar to his 1932 movie, uh, What Price Hollywood. He agreed to directing this version of the film because it would be his first Technicolor feature and his first big movie musical. 
He would later find even greater success in movie musicals with My Fair Lady. James Mason had an extensive acting career, expanding over 50 years, but mostly I just know him as the villain from North by Northwest and Eddie Izzard impersonating for a stand-up comedy. Judy Garland, to most people, is probably best known for Wizard of Oz, but her talents weren't limited to just film. She was an amazing dancer and singer. Her husband at the time, the producer for this movie, Sidney Luft, gave her this role because he was trying to give her a film comeback. Judy Garland had kind of gained a reputation for being difficult to work with and having chemical dependency problems. Because her husband was the producer and she was trying to get a film comeback, she tried very hard for this movie, and you can see it in the scene, the emotional scenes. She's acting her heart out. The reality behind the scenes of this movie being the reverse of the film's plot, and this being essentially the end of Judy Garland's career, even though it's about a star finding her rise to fame, gives this movie a coating of irony that I can really appreciate. Okay, last one. The 1976 version of A Star is Born switches its focus from the film industry to an area that was gaining major influence in pop culture in the 1970s. Hard rock was gaining in popularity and arena rock and country rock were at their commercial peak in the 70s, so why not focus on a rock star? I mean, considering what we've seen in the other two versions of this film, it'll be the demise of a rock star, but yeah, rock star. Chris Christopherson plays our leading man, Norman Mi uh... John Norman Howard, not Norman Maine. They kept the Norman, but yeah, John Norman Howard. John is a bit of a drunk, and uh, oh, okay, and he also uh, indulges in snorting coke from Gary Busey. Okay, it was the 70s, sure, okay, I can live with that, yeah, coke off of Gary Busey. He seems to continually damage the concert venues shows up hours late sometimes, and even forgets the lyrics of his own songs. So, his popularity decline, you get set up at the very beginning of the movie, and it's understandable how he falls out of fame. After a concert, John runs off to a bar, and oh my word, I, it had me laughing. Chris Christopherson falling over himself like he was in a 1930s comedy, and then Robert England, out of nowhere, as a fan. It's October, so... If I'm watching a movie with him in it, then it counts as a horror movie, right? Right? And the introduction to Barbara Streisand's character it was probably the funniest bit of all. Like, you see the stage, and you see two black women singing, and then she just pops up in the middle. Like, she was bending down for some reason on stage and just pops up to the mic. And then you hear the band name called The Oreos. Oh my word, the subtle racism. Although, to be technical, wouldn't it just be Oreo? I mean, it's just the two black women and the white cream filling. That's just one Oreo, right? John continually distracts Barbara Streisand's Esther from her singing, and she calls him out on it, and he apologizes and then starts to actually listen to her. He's so busy listening, he's trying to ignore Robert England being a fan. He's trying to get John to go up on stage and sing, calling what Barbara Streisand is doing is not good. And it leads to a fight, and it leads to Esther and John sneaking out the back and going to back to her house. John brings Esther to a concert the next day, and he tries to get her to sing on stage, but she freaks out and runs away, and he chases after her. And then a fan gives him a motorcycle, and he rides onto stage, and then drives off the stage and gets hurt. And Esther winds up getting left behind at the concert while he's taken on a helicopter to the hospital. It follows the 1954 Esther storyline for a bit here. She keeps on working at what she's doing and even actually winds up singing for a commercial. Well, at least she, she is until she gets her and her friends fired. But because of that, John's able to find Esther where she's recording. And the story picks up pace again. John invites Esther to a big event, gets her to sing on stage, she becomes a big hit, they get married. And then they get back from the honeymoon, and John realizes he's not really needed anymore. Apparently, while he was on his honeymoon, his band went off and did their own album without him. Uh, they do the drunken award ceremony again, uh, but this time it's a Grammy. And there's not a Oscar backhand like in the first two movies. Actually, he like accidentally knocks her over and doesn't even realize he did it at the time. So you don't really get the devastation that you did in the first two movies. Now, after this, there's there's one thing that happens that seems really out of character for, for for the leading man of these stories. And as far as I can tell, the newest one 
completely ignores it happening in this movie. At some point, John cheats on Esther. I mean, just out of nowhere. And it's not like it means anything to him. He's still totally in love with her, and it resolves itself after two or three minutes in the movie. Like, it never even happened. It's... It's out of nowhere. Left field is not necessary. I mean, you could still have the same result without the scene even being in there. It's just supposed to be some emotional heartstring tugging, but... I mean, it's it's total betrayal. I mean, in the first two movies, you had Norman Maine. He, he's self-destructive, and he's irresponsible, but all of the stuff that he does winds up backfiring on him. I mean, you know, the people he works for, too, his own career. But it, it it's focused on him, damage to himself. It never really affects the Esther of the of that movie. I mean, yeah, they I guess they're hurt because the person they love is hurt, but it's not like anything he does is directly aimed at them purposefully. Like like this is. So it's it, it's jarring. It's out of place. Maybe that's what they were going for. They wanted something jarring and out of place. I don't know. Okay, big difference here. They live on a ranch out in the middle of the desert. They don't live at a beach house in Malibu, so how is John going to drown in this version? Oh, he's not? He's he's going to crash a red Ferrari going 160 miles an hour? Okay. Yeah, I, th I think that'll do it. Yeah, he'll die from that. After his death, Esther doesn't need a motivational speech to get back on stage. Apparently, just like, she's ready to go. And then there's like 10 minutes of singing, and then the movie ends. 10 minutes of singing. It's, this movie is way too long. This movie is way too long for the story that they gave it. I mean, you know, the second one's longer still, but, I mean, it had set pieces, but this one you just get close-up shots of their face and just singing for ten minutes at a time. Overall, I like this version better than the 54 version. But there's, like, a few glaring spots that bother me so much, I can't just find myself to love it like I do the 37 version. I wonder if... If there wasn't so much time of the movie dedicated to Chris Christopherson and Barbara Streisand just staring at each other, because that's a lot of the movie, they just stare at each other and there's sometimes minutes of them not talking just, uh. if there wasn't that much of that, I feel like some side characters could have been developed. I mean, I, I vaguely recall... John's manager in the movie. Like, he's got, like, two scenes. I mean, the only side character that really gets any headway story-wise is Bobby, the Gary Busey character, but he's only in there for, like, he has three minutes worth of lines in a 140-minute movie. He only has, like, three minutes of lines. So, yeah, I could have used some side character development. At least if there had been some, then there would have been somebody to give Barbara Streisand a motivational speech. But you know what, maybe they just didn't want to give her that because they wanted her to be a strong, independent woman. And I'd believe that if, like, for most of the movie, she wasn't begging John to do stuff for her. She's like, oh, I don't want to go on tour without you. You have to come with me and sing along, too. You guys aren't in the same genre of music. He's a rock star, and you're doing Barbra Streisand music. It, it wouldn't make any sense. Stop it. I'm fine with the songs in this movie, more than I am the 1954 version, but I feel like it could have been cut in half because there's a lot of replay on these songs. You hear the same song three, four times, different versions of it, but at least when these songs are performed, you get the actors, uh, they get to act as well, you know, because they're not acting in the scene, they're just singing and then they can look at each other and you see the emotions across their face and it works better. Wait, sorry, in this version of the film, that one more look at one more look at you line that's in been in every version of the film it it starts at the beginning of like John's downfall not at the beginning of their relationship so the line doesn't frame the relationship it frames John's downfall which seems out of place to me I feel like that one more look at you line should frame the relationship because he says it at the beginning and at the end of their time together but in this one, he just does it to frame, it's like, oh, alright, I'm going to say this line, and then everything goes to crap, and then I'll say the line, and then I'll die. It doesn't work as well as it did in the other movies. Barbra Streisand received an Oscar, a Golden Globe, and a Grammy for her original song, Evergreen, for the movie soundtrack, and she also received a Golden Globe for her role in the film. 
The director Frank Pearson I know from several of his writing credits, including movies like Cool Hand Luke and Dog Day Afternoon, as well as the TV show Mad Men, which he was also a creative producer on until his death in 2012. And the producer is a man I shudder to mention because he's made some great decisions and poor decisions. And he's even the producer for the new 2018 version too, but uh, it's John Peters. Yes, he's made some amazing films like Caddyshack and American Werewolf in London, and Clue. I love Clue. That's a great movie. But he's also made some horrible decisions like Caddyshack 2, Superman Returns, Man of Steel, a movie that Christopher Nolan had to bar him from the set of, and Wild Wild West. I wonder if Nolan banned Peters from the Man of Steel set because he kept on bringing up a giant spider. Since he couldn't get a giant spider in the Kevin Smith Superman movie with Nick Cage that he wanted, I wonder if he is like producing all these sp Superman movies trying to get that giant spider that he wanted back with Kevin Smith and Nick Cage. <sighs> what a ridiculous person. Oh, and uh, I don't want to forget Chris Christopherson. He is a singer-songwriter and actor, and he earned a Golden Globe for his role in this film. I remember him from his roles in the Blade movies, and I know he's been in a few westerns as well. Actually, he's in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Why did he play a rock star? Is that why Bradley Cooper plays a country singer in the new movie? Alright, wrapping it up. Alright, my list of these movies from best to worst is the 1937 version, the 1976 version, and then the 1954 version. And by the time I'm editing this film, I'll have seen the new movie, so I'll put that in the list here somewhere too. The 54 version and the 76 version, they both have qualities that I enjoy, but I don't love them for the most part overall like I do the 37 version. Anyway, let's hope that this new version of A Star Is Born can enlighten its audience to the darker side of fame, and hopefully it's not just a whole bunch of Lady Gaga fans going to watch it, and you know, the movie's actually watched for being a movie, not a vehicle for a pop star. Alright, so we got Bradley Cooper as Jackson... Maine. As Jackson Maine. Okay, bring back the original last name this time. Great. And then we got Lady Gaga as Allie. Okay, throw Esther in the trash. Allie. Alright, well I'm off to go see the newest version of the movie. Talk to you guys later. Thanks for watching. Do you want to go home now? I don't want to, but I will.